Welcome everybody to the October 10th meeting of the Blackstone Millville Regional School District School Committee. If you would join me and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we will have an introduction of members, and we'll start. Sure. Yes. Bethany Dunton, Blackstone Rep. Tammy Lemieux, Blackstone. Erin Bernardo, Millville. Jane Reggio, Millville. Jack Keith, Blackstone. Karen Vernon, Millville. Sarah Williams, Blackstone. Matt Aaronworth, Assistant Superintendent. Jason DeFalco, Superintendent. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, we do not have our students with us if, this evening. Hopefully they'll join us for our meeting in November uh, and have an update for us. And uh, no public forum, so we'll move to Consent Agenda A. We have the warrants and the me minutes of the meeting from September 19th. Uh, and no, any questions on that? I'll entertain a motion to approve Consent Agenda A. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Jack, seconded by Tammy. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. Abstentions. That's me. Okay. Me. I don't think I was there oh. this, that last time. I missed, I missed September 19th. I'm pretty sure I missed okay. June. Okay. So we're good. That's the whole world. Okay. <clears throat> um, school committee. We have, so, so as we are developing our plans and our overarching goals for the school committee, uh, we've also tried to make a commitment to be more involved in the different efforts of the district and of the state in terms of different conference availability, training availability for us. And there are some key uh, programs and events coming up that if people are interested, I know we would like to have some represent representatives at it. Um, the first one is the summit schools, the summit meeting on Tuesday, October 16th. And that's to visit some schools and see what that programming is like. Do you want to say anything else about that? Uh, sure. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about it uh, in my report later. But um, it is an opportunity for us to explore uh, true personalized learning um, that is really anchored in uh, a project-based approach for students and teachers. And so we're going to have an opportunity to explore um, upper elementary, uh, middle and high schools that have uh, really embraced and implemented this model. And so this is a chance to get out and check it out and we're we're hoping that an entire team will go so uh definitely some school committee members if people have availability to um, do that are the parents that are involved in this already on board so we, we are actually um opening opening it up to everybody so we you know any parent that's interested um, if they can notify my office um, just by emailing uh, bridget walsh and i the packet uh, is up on the website and so that information is uh, there as well but just by emailing Bridget uh, informing uh, us that they'd like to attend we'd love to have parents join us uh, and of course the committee as well to go out and explore and see if this might be something that uh, as a community we'd like to uh, pilot or take on for next school year uh, we will have school-based teams from the middle and high school uh, uh, teachers and uh, administration attending as well but uh, yeah it's open to all all folks that would be interested in going Uh, another opportunity is the leading with access and equity uh, and there is a meeting regarding that on November 1st uh, it's a Thursday and I'm actually gonna throw it back to you so you can tell us more about that sure so the uh, Department of Education is hosting um, essentially an equity uh, summit if you will and uh, we are going to hear from um, their guest speaker uh, superintendent Eric Gordon from Cleveland Public Schools who has really spent a lot of his time uh, in his leadership position focusing in around the social-emotional uh, development of, of children uh, in his district and how they've really used uh, that uh, work around social-emotional learning to help transform their schools. And so it's an opportunity for us to hear, um, you know, not only what other local folks are doing, uh, school districts are doing, but also at the national level and for us, as you know, we have a social-emotional learning uh, team at the district level 
that is doing a lot of this work and building a framework for each one of our schools and the district as a whole. And so we'll be taking that team uh, to this conversation on the 1st of November. We'd love to have uh, committee members join us as well if, if you can. And then November 7th through 10th is the MASC, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees Conference, uh, held down on the Cape. Many of us uh, went last year, and I'm hoping we're... I'm working on it. Okay. Tammy's it's working on to, going. It's tough to finagle um, three days out of yeah, work. Yeah. In a row. But, but it, it's mm -hmm. the opportunity to go to the entire conference or to go to particular days. I will tell you the beginning of the conference holds more in terms of workshops than the end. Like that Saturday, it's kind of a wrap up type of a day, but the beginning if you have a day. Um, but you would just need to let Bridget know that you have interest so that she can process the registration. And then we received, and I forwarded an email to each one of you about the Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools. Um, and they have a, a series, um, they have a, a workshop coming up where the education commissioner will be um, and then a, a different other opportunities which is that in our packet so. yes yeah mm -hmm. um, but if people have interest to either register for those or just let folks um, we can register the committee if they want to yeah. let us know I signed up for the second one the second one yep okay so 10 today uh, yes, with the commissioner. Yeah, that was today. And then next week, the 17th, session two. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. But if anybody else has interest in those, please, I would encourage the more we participate, the more we know, the better it helps our students here and, and our district. So I encourage everybody to participate when and how they can. Uh, report of the superintendent. Thanks, Ms. Reggio. Uh, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, tonight, uh, we have an opportunity to have a, a very public discussion about the, the spring 2018 uh, MCAS, MCAS 2.0 um, student achievement and accountability data. And so um, at our last school committee meeting, we talked uh, quite a bit about the new accountability system as a structure itself. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, actually it might have even been the next day to be frank, um, but the data was released uh, from the Department of Education. Uh, the embargo was lifted and we were able to share those results with our school community. Um, we um, did take the op that opportunity to send out uh, a message to our uh, school community, our families, um, our staff, to really uh, do a kind of a high level overview of how our students and our schools performed. Um, and tonight we're going to talk um, a little bit about that, uh, but we're also going to go a little bit deeper um, into that analysis and talk about how we did uh, also compared to the state average uh, in terms of, you know, content in, in grades across the Commonwealth. But I want to be really clear before we get into this conversation, um, and I think that this is important to note, that this is one data point. And so MCAS is just one data point. Um, and it's an important one, but it's not the only one. And so uh, we certainly, you know, we certainly use this information uh, at the, at the um, classroom and building level to help us think about how we are approaching our teaching and learning. But I do want to underscore uh, to all those watching at home and those in the audience um, that if we teach and when we teach the right material, the right way, these scores will come along. And so I just want to be really clear that although it's important, uh, it is just one, uh, one piece of information that we have to help us assess how we are doing moving forward. And so the first slide we're going to look at is actually um, the accountability data itself. Um, and remember, we've got two kind of categories of data. We have our accountability data and we have our performance data. And so the first slide looks at our accountability data. And if we remember back to uh, the, the uh, last school committee meeting, we talked about this data being organized essentially into two buckets. Uh, we have that number that shows us how we did compared to ourselves, so how many points out of the possible 100% of points we could attain. And then we have our accountability percentile, which shows how did we do compared to others, um, others in, the, in the state in our same grade span. 
And so if we remember this year, what's different in terms of the accountability percentile number is middle schools and elementary schools are now in the same bucket, where prior they were separated out. The middle schools were in one bucket, elementary schools were in a second bucket, and then the high schools were separate and apart in their own third bucket. That is the case still for the high schools. They are in their own category, but middle and elementary are now in one category, the same category for grades three through eight. And so what you'll notice uh, on our first slide is that uh, we have the percent of points out of 100 each of our schools attained and our district. And so you will see that as a school district, we achieved 56% of the possible points afforded to us. At the high school, 68%. At the middle school, 33 At AFM, 50 And at Millville, 56 And so none of our schools um, met their targets. Uh, we all partially met our targets under the new state uh, categorization system, uh, but none of our schools are requiring any state intervention as, um, either. And so, um, you know, last night I had an opportunity to, uh, Mr. Aaronworth and I had an opportunity to speak with the Blackstone um, Board of Selectmen, and uh, we just gave a couple of sound bites of our data and uh, really shared with them that, you know, when you see that we, uh, by and large, are achieving about half our points as a district, right, when you think of 50%, that's right in the middle, right, and that's essentially average. And so we know that our teachers and students are far above uh, above that and so we certainly have a lot of work to do and at the end of this we're going to talk about at a deeper level that so what now what piece mm -hmm. um, that we keep re-anchoring our conversations in but just wanted to highlight that um, last year as a district we did achieve 56 percent of our points now when you look at the accountability percentile so this is how we did compare to everybody else across the commonwealth no districts are given um, a percentile um, and so as a district, we are not in need of state intervention either, but instead we are labeled as partially meeting our targets, um, which, is a, which is an accurate reflection of where we are. The high school is in the 36th percentile of statewide performance, the middle school in the 25th, uh, the uh, Maloney School in the 41st. So from a statewide perspective, uh, AFM is performing stronger than any of our others when compared to like schools, which is that grades three through eight uh, and Millville is in the 25th percentile. And so uh, we certainly have a lot of work to do. Um, and I do want to say that with the plans we are laying out and have laid out in terms of our overall strategy, uh, we, are, we are definitely moving in the right direction with that. And as we're going through this, by all means, please do ask whatever questions you might have. Where, where would you see <clears throat> state intervention? So. Yes, and so uh, typically what state, what the Department of Education is doing is uh, for this year, they are not naming any new schools that will fall into that category. Uh, but what they have done is essentially renamed the level four and five schools, which level four is um, essentially needing a formal turnaround, and level five is receivership, which means the local has lost um, governance over the school. Um, and so um, those schools are in the bottom 10%. Any other questions on this piece before we move forward? All right. So we're going to look a little bit at our performance data. And so um, you will see a few different categories here. Um, we have percent proficient in advanced or slash exceeding and meeting expectations. And so uh, that's important to note because there are two different exams. The high school is still on the MCAS legacy. So they have the old performance ratings, which is advanced, proficient, needs improvement, or warning. The middle and elementary schools are on the new MCAS 2.0, and so they have uh, the new performance categories, which is exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, partially meeting, and not meeting. And so I apologize if that looks a little, uh, little confusing, um, but I wanted to make sure that we labeled everything correctly. Uh, moving forward, next year the high school will be in line with the other performance categories so we'll be able to have all the same uh, category titles but for now we have to uh, stick with the two different uh, titles for each category and so <clears throat> if you look at uh, BMR high school you will see that in English language arts 89 percent of our students 
either um, um, were advanced or proficient. I think one of the things to really underscore here um, that I think really shows the power of uh, some of the work being done at the high school is that 52% of the students last spring were advanced. And so often when you see numbers laid out like this, we tend to see a stronger number in the proficient column and less in the advanced column. Uh, at BMR High School, we have the opposite. We have more students that are scored advanced uh, in English language arts, um, which is a really good indicator of us moving in the right direction. Uh, and you will see that uh, students that were in warning or didn't pass the exam were at 1%. Um, our student growth percentile, remember the uh, state target is 50, right? That would be your average score. And so what that number means is when you look at the year prior, how many students that had the same score as you did you outperform that next year? So it's really looking at that measure of growth and not just achievement. And those two numbers are really important. And so you'll see at the high school, our 10th graders outperformed about 50% of their peers in terms of where they scored as eighth graders. So that's significant. So not only did we have strong uh, student performance from, from an actual achievement perspective with almost 90% of our kids advanced or proficient, but the kids also grew. So there was some nice growth, individual growth there as well. Um, at the middle school, this is where the assessment shifts. So now we go to the MCAS 2.0, which we know is a much more rigorous and more challenging test than our MCAS legacy. Uh, we are at 44% of students uh, exceeding or meeting expectations. AFM was at 48%, and Millville Elementary was at 33% of the students exceeding or meeting expectations. And so what you see here are the grade averages. So uh, this can be all broken down by grade level, uh, but what we have here is this summary data that shows at the middle school, for instance, grades si uh, six, seven, and eight English language arts combined. When you break the data out, you do see some different patterns and trends in terms of uh, grade level specific um, scores. But if for our purposes, this is probably the best way to look at it because it gives us a little bit more of a bird's eye view of how each individual school is doing with their performance. Um, if you are to move to the other end of the, uh, to the table, you'll see mm -hmm. that not meeting expectations, uh, the um, middle school was at 11%, um, Maloney School was at 5%, and uh, Millville Elementary was at 9% of students not meeting expectations for English language arts. To me, that seems high. Is that high? Um, so um, in a couple of slides, we're going to look at the uh, state comparison. And so to answer that question, um, and that's a very good question, well, it will give you a good snapshot in terms of on average how, you know, how we're doing. Um, and that we actually have broken down by grade level by content. So we can take a good, uh, kind of a deeper look at that. You'll notice that by and large, the majority of our children across all schools are in that partially meeting expectations. And so that means they're almost there, they're close. And so with some, um, some deeper work on curriculum, which again, we'll talk about more towards the end, and some, uh, some shifts of instructional practice and, and learning opportunities for kids will definitely get there. And then of course, the student growth percentile numbers. Again, we wanna shoot for 50. That's the average number. So you can see we're a bit lower um, in, in the middle school and the two elementaries than the high school. Shifting gears and looking at mathematics. Again, same data table, same kind of layout. Uh, you'll see that our math scores at the high school are a little bit lower. 80% of our students are proficient or advanced. But again, we see that same pattern where 53% of our students are advanced in mathematics. Again, on this measure. And I want to just underscore this is only one measure. It's an important measure. And it's, and it's a normed measure that is compared to other 10th graders um, across the Commonwealth in terms of our high school and similarly with grades three through eight. So it is an important measure, but it's not the only measure. But so as we delve into this, we can see um, that 53% were, um, were advanced at the high school. 27% of students were proficient. And if we go to the other end, we'll see that 3% of our students were in that warning category. 
And so the unique thing about uh, BMR High School is we had about 100 students tested. And so 3% is re it's three. <coughs> three kids, right? So when you look at it behind the percentages, the numbers are pretty direct because it was roughly 100 students that tested. And so, you know, we're looking at a class of 100, and three of those students didn't pass the exam, where 53 of those kids are categorized as advanced. Um, and our student growth percentile is at 47, which is very close to the target, which is, which is 50. We then go to the middle school. Again, the test shifts. This is the new uh, 2.0, uh, MCAS 2.0, which is more rigorous. You can see that our meeting and exceeding numbers are 41% at the middle school, 47 at the Maloney School, and 28 at Millville Elementary. And again, this is a summary. So Millville and AFM, this is grades three through five combined. At the middle school, it's six through eight combined. If we are to walk down to the other end of the uh, data table, we'll see that the not meeting um, category, 7% of the middle school students did not meet expectations, um, which means they did not meet the grade level standards that are set. Um, the Maloney School was at 10%, and uh, Millville was at 7%. So an interesting point of reference on the student growth percentile, and this is why this number is so important. So if we look at Millville Elementary, and we, we kind of lift that data out of, the, out of the table that's in front of us, you'll notice that our meeting exceeding percentages are, are lower, right? right? Far lower than the other schools. But I do want to highlight the student growth percentile. So what that means is, although we have uh, a lower achievement at MES, our student growth percentile is almost at 57%, which means that the kids at Millville outgrew 57% of the kids that were in the same category with them the year prior. So what this says is we have a lot of work to do at Millville, of course, but the, the kids are growing. And so you can see that by, by looking at that SGP number. And so that's why that balance of achievement and growth is really important to note on that. A lot of work to do in mathematics, clearly. But you can see that um, there is some growth there. To really get our arms around, at, at a deeper level, the mathematics data, um, you would want to look at longitudinal numbers. You'd want to look at this over time to see what's been happening with our achievement numbers over time. And this is just a snapshot. This is just last year. Let me pause here. For I thought they were supposed to take the last two years, no? They did, but this data is only the 2018. The okay. these, uh, 2017 data is public, and we could, of course, look at that to look at those trends. But the, the SGP is Two from year. the Parent. previous year. The SGP is the – that's this year's SGP, mm -hmm. and it looks at how many students at Millville Elementary in mathematics were right, outgrew from the year before. So the kids at MES – Grades four and five, remember, there's no growth data for third grade, mm -hmm. right, because it's the first time they take it, so it's just grades four and five. So the fourth and fifth graders outgrew 56% of their peers. So if you were to create a chart like this with last year's mm -hmm. data, based on the way they look right now with the bubble in the middle, would we have seen it? No? Well, would it, would it have been not meeting expectations? I mean, if they grew, yeah, but, but, and they're not in the... But compared to their... So it, they may have been partial last year. They're still partial this year. Right. But they're partially... They're ahead of the other group, who somebody else who was partial as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean there's a shift. But my concern is... The that achievement are not, number. That are, are the, the folks in the not meeting care category are statistically significantly higher than the ones in the advanced. Like, mm -hmm. like yes. how do we shift, you know, what's happening from, from elementary, middle, I realize it's a different test, so I, sure. we're not comparing apples school. and oranges, mm -hmm. but we've got some pretty advanced students in our high school, mm -hmm. and we've got middle, in, in ELA, it's, it's, it's almost worse. Um, yeah. What's, ha why? What's happening? Yeah. yeah. So that's a really good question, and it's the right question to ask. And so, so as we continue to delve into the scores, there are a few things we have learned um, 
about the math and literacy instruction. And so uh, we have really focused kids and we have really strong teachers and everybody is, is moving their classrooms. What we are noticing though is between the schools, there are different, um, there is different, uh, there are different standards being taught um, and there's a different level of um, uh, fidelity, if you will, with our Reader's Workshop and with our Envisions program. And so right now, we are looking at how do we work to align the what, which is the curriculum and the resources, and the how, which are our instructional practices. And so as, a, as an example, we had a professional development day on Friday, and we had all of the elementary teachers together. And so all of the third grade teachers, regardless of the school where you teach third grade, were working together around um, Reader's Workshop, but particularly looking at uh, creating a lesson around expository writing. And so there needs to be a lot more alignment between the schools. Um, we need to do a lot more work around shoring up our curriculum and making sure that um, our standards, uh, you know, our curriculum are aligned to the standards, uh, which right now we still have a lot of work to do in, in, in the curriculum uh, world, so to speak, which we're going to talk about at the end of this. Um, and so you'll see that. And so one of the things that really jumped out at me is that there's really no consistency in our data. Mm -hmm. You can't find a particular pattern or trend that's emerging with a, with a specific content area uh, because we haven't had, um, to no fault of the teachers at all or the students, we haven't had a deep level of focus on the instructional piece nor on the curriculum development work. And so while I think teachers, from what I've been able to gather so far in my entry, um, have been working very hard to put together curriculum um, you know, with their, with their colleagues in their buildings, that alignment work hasn't been put in place for them, and neither has the support in developing that level of curriculum, which is our backbone. That's what we're teaching kids. And so I think, I think our teachers have done really great work with what they have and the direction in which they've been given, uh, in support and so now it's time to really double down on that effort uh, and that support and we do have a strategy for that that's on our agenda tonight we'll talk about uh, to really help align the, the the what of our work which is the curriculum and the resources because right now we're seeing results like this uh, because of that okay. does that answer your yeah. question yeah science also really jumps out at us um, you will notice some significant discrepancies in our science results. And so you will see at the high school level, we take biology. 70% um, of our students were advanced and proficient. Uh, in this situation, we had 12% of our students in advanced, 58% in proficient, 7% of our students in the warning categories. When we look at the middle school, um, that number uh, shifts significantly to 30%. Um, uh, media, uh, advanced and proficient. Uh, the science exam is under the old MCAS test with the old categories. They haven't shifted that over to the new exam yet at any grade level. And so you will see that we have 4% of our uh, students who are advanced, 26 proficient, uh, with 11% not passing the exam or in warning. Uh, at AFM for grade five, um, there is a, a significant difference in terms of how AFM perform versus MES and the middle school. Um, and so 57% of the fifth graders were advanced or proficient with only 4% warning. Um, and you'll see at MES, we have 31% were advanced and proficient uh, with 17% uh, not passing the exam, which is the highest um, warning rate we have. Uh, but again, I want to draw everyone's attention to that needs improvement category. That means those students are right on the cusp. And so again, you know, I really want to underscore the fact that we don't have a science curriculum. We don't have a science program. Our teachers have not been given the tools, the resources that they need to instruct at the degree and the depth that they need to. At AFM, from what I understand, the fifth grade teachers took science head on and did a lot of uh, teamwork to really get prepared for this, to make sure the students knew what they needed to know and had access to that material. Uh, but as far as there being a, you know, a district movement in that direction, that has not happened yet, and it will. Um, as you know, many of the uh, 
many of the career paths for kids and the careers that exist now are STEM. They're mm -hmm. in the science fields. And so when you look at information or data like this, it certainly shows that uh, our science work is not anywhere near where it needs to be, or uh, is it anywhere near where it will be when we are finished with this school year. Um, but we have a lot of work to do here, um, in science in particular. And so, um, you know, with that, I'll pause on this piece to mm -hmm. see if there are any questions. I mean, this is in direct correlation to the fact that we did not have science curriculum for the last several years, and now that's being addressed. So uh, we're, you know, and I can just say for the AFM number, um, my daughter is now in 10th grade, and she still quotes her science teacher from AFM on various things. And yeah. each time she does it, I send the teacher a little note. Tori still remembers what you said about those atoms and molecules. So it's great. Good. And you know, I, I just want to underscore something at the elementary level in particular, because our elementary teaching staff is tasked with a, with, with, with a lot. And so when you have a six and a half hour day with your classroom of X number of students, depending upon which school you're in, um, or which grade level you're in, because we do have, you know, as, as close class sizes as we've ever had between the two elementary schools. Um, but they are tasked with being experts in literacy, with being experts in mathematics, with being historians, and with being experts in science. Not to mention, the kids have to have their enrichments, right? Their art and their music and their phys ed, and all these things are really great. But I do sit back as a former elementary school teacher, myself, taught, having taught third, fourth, and fifth grade, somewhat in awe of what our elementary teachers are up against at times in terms of just preparing for those four different, um, four different sets of, of content. And so with that, uh, that certainly is no excuse, but what it does is, as superintendent, it really makes sure that I am doubling down the effort and support to give the teachers the resources and time and materials they need so they can prepare appropriately to meet the needs of our students. Uh, this isn't, you know, science is no longer open up, you know, your textbooks to chapter one, read these two paragraphs and answer the 10 questions in the back, which I'm very sad to say it probably never should have been that. And my sense is it's probably what it was for many of us. Um, that's not how our teachers want to do science, uh, which is a testament to them. It's not how we should be doing science. It's not how kids learn. We want kids doing science and engaged in experiments and interactive labs. And so uh, I forecast all of that because there's a lot of work to be done. The, the next generation science standards aren't new. They've been out for, for two years, uh, and we haven't done with them anything that we need to be doing with them, um, but we will. Uh, but I share that because with that is going to come a very rigorous process for developing curriculum that's going to cost, there'll be an expense, and so will there to be securing the materials and the resources that our teachers need to do this right. Because again, it's not just a matter of getting a textbook. Well, the other, the other piece of that that comes into play <coughs> that, that we can't forget either is that, you know, we, our, our numbers have decreased and we have lower enrollments. And so we have, you know, some teachers who are taking this all on, taking it on alone. We may have one classroom of fourth graders or one classroom right. of, so that fifth grade teacher doesn't have a team to share responsibility or divide and conquer they they when you say do it all they truly have to uh, you know <coughs> to to do it all and we really need to um, not only look at curriculum but look at the professional development like you said where we're giving the people support but looking at finding ways to bring teams together and whether that's combining schools whether that's creating professional learning community time whatever that is we need to really put that in the forefront so we make sure that people aren't islands acting up by themselves. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that. And if I may, you know, that really does, you know, beg the, the question of, you know, what is the level of peer-to-peer -peer support our teachers uh, have had? And what's the opportunity they've had to do some of that, you know, kind of peer observation and, you know, co-planning lessons together, uh, but also, you know, in BMR, we, we do not have instructional coaches. And instructional coaches are essentially teachers that are working side by side with other teachers, and it's their job, just like any coach, right? Just like a running coach or a basketball coach, to really partner with that teacher to help develop lesson plans, 
to help give informal feedback. That's not evaluative in any, in any way, shape, or form, but to really help build the capacity of their peers. And so, again, I'm forecasting this for the committee because there is a very clear direction that we're going to need to start taking the district as we continue to address uh, the numbers that are in front of us. Do you know, um, and you can certainly get back to me on this, that is AFM teaching half year of science? I don't believe so, but let me find that out for sure. So the delivery in Millville, and I, I could be corrected too, it's half a year of social studies, half a year of science. Um, why, why are we still doing that in, at the elementary level when it is such an important part of, I mean, like you just said, STEM. So why is science still being shortchanged where it doesn't even get a full year of, of study? So I would, have to, I would have to speak directly with the teachers to get under the surface of that. My quick response would be, it's really difficult to teach something that you don't have a curriculum for, nor do you have resources for. Mm -hmm. And so instead, you have teachers that have you know, an, a 45 minute to an hour preparation period a day for literacy, math, social studies, and or science, right? Uh, and sometimes they're meeting with parents and doing other things, or meeting with students or administration and they're trying their best to prepare that. And so that's hard when you're not sure what the standards are, you're not sure the actual sequence in which we should be teaching certain things, and nor do you have the lab materials or equipment that you need in order to do that. Just curious with that huge difference up there, if the delivery is the same, that's yeah. why I'm asking. And that's I, a great I, question, I can, I can get an answer to that. I'm not, I, I mean, when my kids were in fifth grade, it was, it was half year. My current fourth grader is, half a year of social studies, half science, so. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to report back on that to everybody. And uh, just to piggyback that, I would be curious just to see where band fits in for fifth grade. Um, again, I'm, I'm going back more years because it used to be that they missed something to go to band and then they had to catch up that with the teacher grade. after the fact. Yeah. So That's I don't know true. if they missed science or social yeah. studies, but they missed a content area to go to band at some point. But, when my boys were in fifth, they did too. It rotates though, it's not the same one. Okay. It's it's every, we, it, it flips. I'm just so curious what they miss if one the data what shows they miss that the next that week. impacts something somewhere as well, you know, because the works. consistency of some all the subjects. And I also know at times my son was, you needed to finish your work to a certain extent before you went to band. So there were times that he didn't go to band because he was catching up on content. So, yeah, I'm happy to look into that, too. And if it's the same in both buildings. Right, and what the approach is, definitely. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, and so next, um, we have an opportunity to look at how we did uh, by grade level, by content, compared to the state. So, um, Jane, this gets to your, mm -hmm. your question about, you know, what is, is that high? The number seems high. And so this will give you a sense of, of how uh, we did compared to uh, the rest of uh, the, the state at, in terms of the grade level and, and subject. So, um, you know, the, the table is fairly direct and you see the meeting and exceeding uh, at the district level, meeting and exceeding at the state level, district warning and state warning. That's a huge job. And so that will show you what you will notice um, is that, and again, I, I, you know, the Department of Education uh, really underscores the fact that 10, a 10% difference is significant. 10% change is significant. So, for instance, in grade three, ELA, we're at 42% uh, meeting or exceeding expectations. We're at the state average, they're at 52%. In math, we're at 43% in grade three, the state is at 50%. Um, and so any place where you see a, a, at least a 10 point gap is significant. You can see grades five in grade seven mathematics, we are a bit ahead of the state in terms of our uh, meeting and exceeding expectations. But something else you'll notice about our data, uh, which is definitely a highlight, is um, in, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, we are lower than the state average in terms of the warning. Mm -hmm. So what that tells us is we have, which we know, we have a lot of kids in that middle, that middle category of partially meeting expectations. And so with the right curriculum support and the right curriculum resources, giving teachers more time and more support to build those lessons, 
in a shift in our instructional practice where we have the students doing a lot of the work, right? We want the kids leaving the end of the day tired, not the teachers, uh, per se. And so with a, with a shift in our instructional practice and with a doubling down of the curriculum development and getting the resources and materials in the hands of our teachers and kids, I think we can move those numbers at a, at a, at a healthy rate. And again, I really want to underscore to the committee that from my perspective as superintendent, it's not just about the numbers. It's more so about teaching the right material in the right ways. The, these numbers are important, but what's more important is what's happening in our classrooms and making sure that we have teachers appropriately resourced with the, with the material they need, using the right instructional practices, putting the emphasis of learning on the kids, and then we'll see a shift in our numbers come along. And I guess I'm still concerned with the warning column um, because you're talking 15% of maybe 100 kids in that class is 15. You're talking 12% of however many thousand kids in the state is a, f a handful of kids. Mm -hmm. So 15 people out of a class of, of 100 is a significant number yes, of people. Yes, that's a lot. Agreed. Agreed. And so we, we do have a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. uh, for sure, yep. uh, with that as well. And that gets to, in particular, the need f of reading and math interventionists, right? Um, but as we've talked about before, until we get to a really strong intervention model, we've got to address the core issues. And the core issues are making sure our teachers have the resources they need and that we have the curriculum that's needed. Uh, along with, and I want to underscore this too, the instructional shifts that need to be put in place to put the emphasis on the learner and not the teacher. This chart to me um, speaks to the need for some vertical alignment between grade levels. Um, you know, we, we talked briefly um, during our budget conversations about how uh, so many districts were going K to eight instead of splitting off at the middle school level. And, and we see that data here that that fifth to sixth grade is a, is a hump. But um, you know, I think it's so important for the vertical alignment so you don't see these kind of peaks and valleys between mm -hmm. grades when you just kind of streamline that curriculum. And I'm sure that will be part of what we do. But. And that's a great point. And that's you yeah. know, what, what I was saying a little earlier, but you, you know, there really are no patterns and trends that emerge from these numbers. Um, except, you know, we do have a lot of work to do. But, you know, if there was an instructional focus as a district on, you know, literacy, then you would, ex you would assume that we would see stronger literacy scores. But again, we haven't, you know, we haven't done that. We haven't had a, you know, a district focus on mathematics either, nor science. And so what you see is, you know, is essentially people doing the best of what they think they should be doing without the level of support that they need. That fifth, <clears throat> excuse me, that fifth to sixth grade jump is also we're merging two elementary schools into the middle school. So we have uh, the different practices that, w that were mentioned before. And hence, to your point, uh, Bethany, the, the, the real need for that alignment mm -hmm. and what we're teaching and how we're teaching. Yeah. We really do, because you're right. If the kids get exposed to very different concepts and content and skills and standards in grade five, and then we bring them together in grade six, mm -hmm. they're gonna come at that from a completely different place. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't be, right? It's right? a great point. Next, we look at the grade 10. So you can see how our high school is faring compared to the state. Uh, and we are more or less right on par mm -hmm. um, with where the rest of our 10th graders statewide are performing. So that gives you a sense. Our high school is, you know, really holding its own comparatively uh, from that perspective. What gets me really excited about the high school work uh, in particular is really thinking about, you know, what happens when we, when we deeper, uh, prepare deeper our curriculum and make some of those shifts in teaching and learning that we're talking about and just imagine what our kids will do then. And so that to me is, is very exciting because they're, you know, they're doing very well now. And of course, we know the high school exam for students is way more high stakes, mm -hmm. right? So we know that. We know the kids come into 10th grade knowing that they need to pass this exam in order to get their, their diploma. Otherwise, they get a certificate of completion. So it's a, it's a, it's a very different level of, um, of stakes here for this. 
and then science. This will give you a sense of how we compared against the rest of the Commonwealth. Grade eight, you'll see, uh, I'm sorry, grade five rather, pardon me, is, is more or less on, on par with where the rest of the state is. Um, but remember, we have a little bit of an outlier here where we had AFM that scored, you know, 57%, right? right. So that number is really high uh, with that. Um, and so those numbers are a little, can be a little misleading uh, when, you, when you peel them back. Um, grade eight science, you'll see we're, you know, we're quite a bit below where we need to be. Uh, and then at high school, we're more or less, you know, on track a little above the state in terms of advanced and proficient numbers. Tells me the state's not doing very good in science either. I would, tell you. I would agree on that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so you've seen this slide, and we've talked about this a lot, and we are going to continue to talk about it. And I know it's starting to work because when we, um, when I'm having conversations with folks around the community, they can repeat this back to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know that it's starting to take. Uh, and so um, these are really the the four kind of pieces of our strategy that are emerging. And, right, and so nothing on here we haven't heard through the past, you know, 45 minutes as we've been discussing this data in terms of looking at the curriculum work, in terms of really defining at a deeper level the how, which is our instructional practice and how students are applying their learning, the focus on the whole child and developing that social-emotional learning framework, and, of course, bringing the communities together. Um, and we cannot underscore that enough. Um, and we do have some information later in our meeting where we'll share uh, hot off the press with the committee about another uh, District of One event coming up in November. So, yeah. we're coming back. Thank you. So if we are okay to move on, mm. uh, this is actually a, a really good segue, I think. Um, next item on our agenda is an update on our curriculum. And so there's really three pieces I just want to update the committee on with this. Um, uh, I recently have had the opportunity to have a conversation with the curriculum office from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. As you know, uh, curriculum is the backbone of our work. Uh, it's what we do in terms of really making sure that we have that aligned both across grade levels and through, right, that vertically up through grade levels, uh, curriculum in place. And um, through uh, a few conversations with the Department of Education, um, BMR has been selected. Um, to participate in um, a partnership with John Hopkins University where they will be working with myself and teachers and principals to help us look at in particular our ELA and math curriculum and identify uh, some gaps and figure out you know where where uh, are we on track and where do we need to make some adjustments to the curriculum in both English language arts and mathematics K to 12 uh, and also do something with us called knowledge mapping, where they will help us look at the level of um, rigor or challenge that our kids are applying their learning to through various activities and give us a sense of what that looks like. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to partner with Johns Hopkins on this. I've had um, a couple conversations with their lead educational professor uh, recently who will be partnering side by side with us on this work. Um, and uh, we'll have an update for the committee, um, hopefully by our November meeting, about the actual dates and when they will be starting. Um, and you know, this is a purely non-evaluative um, opportunity for us to take a really deep look at what our curriculum looks like and what it needs to look like and what gaps we need to fill in math and ELA in particular. Um, and they'll have a set of um, suggestions or thoughts and recommendations for us. I should also mention this is a significant expense. As you can imagine, Johns Hopkins is not cheap, and the Department of Education is paying for the entire thing for Blackstone Mill. So I could not be more thrilled to be able to partner with Johns Hopkins in this work. Go ahead, Aaron. That's wonderful. You emphasize <coughs> ELA and math. Are we, is it not science? Yes, yeah, so um, what so their focus with us is going to be for ELA and math, and that is because um, one of the other items in our agenda is to talk about the district's curriculum development and renewal process. So right now, um, we do not have a concrete curriculum development or renewal process in place. And so what we have done is essentially we have created a, uh, a, a development process that will take a group of uh, administrators and teachers that are interested um, 
through a series of trainings to really work um, with our district-based team on how to actually write and develop curriculum. You know, everybody assumes because you're a teacher or you're a principal that you love to write curriculum and you're really good at it. And that isn't true uh, by any sense. We have some teachers that, that absolutely love it and that are fabulous at it. And we have some teachers and, and principals and administrators that, you know, would, would prefer to be doing other things. <laughs> you know, curriculum isn't necessarily their forte. They want to do the teaching part, right, more so. And so um, we've created a process that is going to really tap on the expertise of those teachers and administrators that want to do that work. And then we are going to provide them as a district um, the training and ongoing support to actually write the curriculum um, to send it out to teachers for feedback to make sure that what we're putting in place makes sense take teacher feedback and then make the adjustments based on the teacher feedback to that curriculum we need this to work for teachers and kids um, that's what we are here for that's why we have a central office that's why we have administration to be a service agent for teachers and kids and so um, with that um, we are going to be starting with science. Ms. Vinacqua, to your question. Um, and we are going to be taking uh, this year to actually develop the science curriculum. Uh, we hope that by the end of April, we will have a rough enough draft uh, that we can actually start piloting some different resources and materials in our classrooms with our teachers to hear from them what worked, what didn't, what they liked, what they didn't like, what they want to continue with, and hear from our kids. Um, what types of resources and materials they like to use, right? It's about the learner, so we need to get their voice clearly in this as well. And so this year we're going to do science so that by the end of this school year uh, and for next fiscal year, we can actually secure the science materials we need and do the training and work with our teachers over the summer so we are ready to launch. One of the challenges that we have in BMR is what tends to happen in most uh, districts that have a curriculum development and revision cycle is you do one content area a year, right? So it can take four years to get through your core subjects, right? English, math, science, social studies. Um, we, you know, we don't necessarily have the luxury of that. We have a lot of curriculum work to do. So the way we sequence this out is we want to start with science. We are hoping that we may be able to add social studies and a social studies curriculum development team to this mix this year. Um, and Johns Hopkins, while that's happening, running parallel, will be working with us to really assess the ELA and math curriculum that we do have in place and materials that we do have in place that would essentially give us feedback by spring that would help us prepare to take math and ELA through this process next year. So this year, science is a must. Clearly, I think you can see that with our results. Uh, social studies is a close second, and we want to we we want to add that to the mix. Um, but you know there is an expense to all of this work, of course, and so uh, we are in the process now of building up the budget for that. And Mr. Aaronworth is working very hard to find the resources uh, for us uh, so that we can do this work the right way. Uh, and then what we will do is utilizing this curriculum development process we will actually build out in subsequent years a rotating cycle so that every year we have a process we know what content is up for renewal we are building the capacity of district-based curriculum teams so teachers and principals that can help support and partner other teachers and principals that are doing this work alongside of myself of course um, and we will have a standing line in our budget for curriculum renewal and so that's the direction in which we want to move in to make sure our teachers have and the kids have the resources that they need. And we are on the cutting edge of curriculum. Right. Um, and so uh, there will certainly be more to come on that and we will certainly update uh, the committee as we are working through this process and in, in our timeline. Um, and the last, piece, the last piece I just want to underscore um, with the curriculum work in your packet, you have a summit learning platform overview sheet that talks a little bit about the summit learning uh, model. And so this is what we are uh, going to be sending some teams out on October 16th uh, to go visit. And so summit schools is a true personalized learning project based um, approach 
to um, classroom instruction. And so um, we are going to be sending out, uh, again, teachers and administrators and any parents that are watching, I please do outreach um, Bridget Walsh in my office uh, if you're interested in attending the learning tour next week. Uh, and of course, school committee members. Um, we want to look at really leveraging our technology and truly leveraging project-based hands-on learning, um, which, is, which is really what is kind of um, the main premise of the Summit platforms. Uh, platform. I, we have had an opportunity to visit a couple of schools recently that have adopted this um, model. Uh, a few schools in Rhode Island, and um, there are only three districts in Massachusetts that are using this. Um, and it has absolutely transformed teaching and learning in the classrooms we've seen. It's really remarkable to listen to how students are talking about their learning and to see the shift in teacher practice and the depth of information that teachers have about what their students know and don't know on any particular standard concept and skill. And so um, we're really excited to send teams out to that. And we'll hopefully have an update for the committee uh, shortly thereafter in terms of some recommendations and thoughts on next steps. So could you just give us um, a visual of what this Tuesday is going to look like for people that want to volunteer? Sure. Um, so um, as I mentioned, we're going to have a couple of school-based teams that are going uh, from the middle and the high school. And uh, they will be visiting um, a fifth grade, uh, some fifth grade classrooms because the summit model is 5 through 12. Uh, they will be visiting middle schools and high schools. And they will have an opportunity to see actual classes in session and see students utilizing uh, at all levels uh, the Summit platform. They will have an opportunity to talk to kids about um, how, this assesses, how this helps them with their learning and hearing from teachers about how it allows them to assess, again, what the kids are you know, knowing and what they don't know, and how they use that information to really adjust their instruction. Um, and so they're going to have a chance on these learning tours um, to speak with teachers, to speak with administrators, to speak with students, and visit classrooms and really see this in action. So if a parent wants to go, are they given a schedule and they meet at the school, or is everybody going together? We all actually will we'll, uh, have a meeting time at uh, the first site. And so the agenda has been built for us. I actually, I will not be attending, mm -hmm. um, but the school-based teams will. And so uh, they, we have an agenda that's already set. It's been organized by Summit Base Camp. It's a, a third party, you know, professional development provider. And they will be leading the learning tours uh, for us. And so we would send that information out to any committee members or families that are interested so they know where the schedule is for the day and where we're gonna start. Anybody else? Questions? Okay. Right. And so the, just the last part of my report this evening um, is an overview on um, kind of the first leg of my work in preparing my evaluation. I am working now with uh, district administration and um, um, school level administration, school level leaders, principals, and working on their evaluative uh, process. and. Uh, am uh, very excited about starting mine. Uh, yeah, I did say excited. Um, <laughs> and, so, um, and so what I would like to propose to the committee, uh, there are essentially two handouts here. The first is uh, kind of an overview that is aligning um, the school committee and superintendent goals. Um, and then, um, you know, around, around three to five district goals, which will then also be added to with a student learning goal and a in my prof uh, professional practice goal. And so what I would like to do is on uh, the um, November 14th meeting, would like to present uh, formally a uh, set of goals to the school committee, uh, three to five district goals that I hope are will be very much aligned with the direction in which the uh, school committee wants the district to move. Um, and I know we've had some preliminary conversations about what those main areas are. Uh, and we'll include in that uh, student learning goals that are going to be based on the accountability and achievement data that we saw this evening. And then um, I am going to set a professional practice goal around the new superintendent induction program. Um, that is something that I, I really appreciate very much the school committee um, uh, enrolling me in and supporting me through. Um, I know that was a big commitment, and I, and I value that very much. And so I'm going to set a professional practice goal around that work as well. 
And so uh, on the November 14th uh, meeting, I would like to have, um, you know, somewhere between five and seven goals for the school committee to review and provide me feedback on and hopefully approve. Uh, the second piece of this is essentially just an overview on the evaluation process itself. And um, just so everyone knows, Aaron and I had a discussion yesterday, um, and uh, we are looking for our um, November workshop to be kind of a review of the superintendent evaluation so that we can understand it better, that we could understand what our role is in it um, and so we have asked um, somebody who was very instrumental in uh, helping us through it in the past as a school committee member to come back and and help train us and use the materials that are available to us to train us on how that work and she has said she can do that yes, on the 28th. okay so on the 28th which is our regular scheduled workshop um, we'll use part of that time to do a training session on superintendent evaluation Who's training us uh, Wendy Oh, nice. Yep. Will we get the rubric before then? Yes. So okay. we'll, we'll get the whole NASC. They have a whole manual. Yeah. We had a little folder last year. Yeah. <laughs> now this year we have a manual. Hmm. Fancy. Hey, the folder <laughs> came from the manual. Um, I, as I, I think, I just think it's very important during the evaluation process to evaluate as we go. Um, we did not evaluate last year Correct. and our first year it was literally the month after we we sat here on April whatever it was <coughs> and then we were evaluating Alan um, three weeks later and on this you know multi-page rubric that we only had a month of right. knowledge and so I think it's super important that we can bond with the rubric and kind of jot down things as we go good or bad so that we can defend our our rating at the time we make it in um, a, a more professional manner than than I felt like I had the experience of the first time around well and, and <laughs> per, it's personal and and you will see on the second handout mm -hmm. which is essentially that timeline that we will revisit Okay. Um, that um, Dr. DeFalco is is very much uh, are very well apprised of what this process is and has built it into his contract even that we we are going to be held accountable for doing this. So we need to learn and be comfortable with what we're doing and um, perhaps get some people on our committee now who would like to take the lead and feel comfortable in this whole process to after. Um, Wendy helps us kind of take the lead and, and walk us through to make sure we stay on track. Thank you. Okay, that concludes my report. Okay. That. Yeah. Well, not as exciting as all the instructional <laughs> things that are going on in the district. Oh, I don't know about that. But I am happy to say that financially things are going smoothly accordingly so that we can continue to fund all of the wonderful things that are happening for the students in the district. Um, the first, uh, as I mentioned, we'll be bringing forward a number of different reports on a regular basis to the committee just to give an overview of how things are going financially and look at um, the various avenues where we're spending money. It's the first report that is in your is in your package is the salary spend down report um, and that has each of the salary classifications broken down um, and then the amount that was budgeted for the FY19 year the amount that has been spent to date and the amount uh, that has been encumbered so far to date um, if you look at the percent budget spent actual which is the very last column down the right side those those numbers should be at or about 25 percent or a little bit past there right now depending on um depending on the timing of the pay cycle because at this point we're now about a quarter of the way through the fiscal year so 
there's nothing at this point. Again, Dr. DeFalco and I had discussed that we've inherited a, a budget that we're we're getting our hands around and trying to make sure that we learn all of the ins and outs of it and we're watching these numbers very closely at this point in time there doesn't seem to be anything alarming um, if you look in the salary report at the second page the balance there currently is a balance there that says there's three hundred twenty six thousand dollars that we can expect to have as a balance that number is going to continue to go down because we're going to continue to encumber more and more funds for the different groups of employees. And the hope is that as we're watching that, it will just fall perfectly in line and come down to maybe a little above zero. That would always be nice. <laughs> um, be nice. But it certainly is going, we're anticipating that it, it will be coming down. I know, I know that everyone had had an opportunity to look at this a little bit. If there, I'll go each sheet, and then if there are any specific questions that people have, I'm certainly happy to answer. Or if there are answers that I don't have right off the bat, I can look into specific concerns and bring them back to the committee <coughs> at another point. I, I have one question. Is this, is this posted as part of our documents online or no? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And um, so that's just a question because I thought of something else. But sure. um, the only thing that stands out here is the custodial overtime. Is yeah. mm. is that a reflection of our mold scenario? That absolutely is. Okay. Um, I mean, um, it says snow, but I know we didn't have snow yet. Did not. <laughs> <laughs> I did. It's it. It is interesting because these um, these reports are actually helping me as I go through them and look more closely in detail. They helped me come up to speed as well because I did find $300 that was misclassified as snow over time. Oh. And I'm like, that's strange given that we haven't had any <laughs> snow yet. But then we went back and identified where there was just a small misclassification in the budgeting software and we, we changed that. Um, but yeah, we are right now, I would say that there have been a couple of specific instances that have contributed to custodial overtime at this point. Um, and as uh, Dr. DeFalco and I referenced at the Blackstone Town meeting, the Board of Selectmen meeting last night, and I think we've mentioned already to the school committee, our philosophy at this point with regards to the facilities and the maintenance of our buildings is we're going to fix what we need to fix. Uh, we, can't, we can't put things out further down the line. So we're going to incur the costs that we need to, and we're going to figure out what changes we need to make as we're moving through the year to make sure that we're, <coughs> you know, we're going to be safe in the rest of our lines. And then concurrently, we'll be working on a much longer term facilities maintenance plan <coughs> that will sustain us in the years to come without just turning a blind eye to the things that have to be taken care of in the buildings. Yeah, did you have a um, the only question I have is how frequently will we see this rerun? This should be run at every meeting. Every meeting. Going mm -hmm. every meeting? Yep. Yeah. The numbers, I, I would say that um, particularly with the second sheet that you see, which is the cost center spend down review, um, <clears throat> I, would, I would propose that though it wasn't really it wasn't updated the projections weren't <coughs> updated at this at this meeting because again i'm still getting my um a little bit of a better sense of the patterns of the spending but at the in typical form it would be at a quarterly and a halfway right. three quarters there would be changes in projections okay. in that last column um so that's something that right now there haven't been any changes to the projections made but as we look more closely at it, Dr. DeFalco and I, we say, hmm, we see that we're going to have some extra funding in this line. Mm -hmm. We're going to move that toward custodial expenses. And we, you may start to see those types of shifts. Okay. Are there other questions on the salary spend down? With regard to the budget summary, um, Things again, if you look down the percentage expended year-to-date column, hopefully things are in line, not 
too significantly over the 25% mark. There are a few items that I would certainly highlight. I think I initially highlighted the uh, my salary, which is hopefully still going to be there. Yeah. Um, the other things that will jump out are the numbers in red. Um, if you look at the classroom technology line, which is two. 2451 function code. It looks like the current available balance is a negative $145,000. Uh, that's because we had to put in a purchase order for the entire cost of the Chromebooks and the technology that we purchased. But uh, we're currently working out the paperwork for the lease that we're engaging in, which is going to be a four year financing. Um, so that number is going to come down. It's just that in order to procure the actual equipment, we have to show the purchase order for our intention to buy all of it. So we're going to be readjusting those numbers to make sure that they reflect the actual expenditures during the course of the year. Similarly, you'll see the same thing in it, right below it in 2720, which is testing and assessment. That $36,000 deficit is that we, um, we signed on to a three-year contract for the STAR testing platform and we're going to be breaking those payments up across the three years but our initial purchase order again had the had the total cost for approximately sixty thousand dollars and can i just add one thing to that Please. mr Unworth? and so that i think that's important to highlight in particular because that was something that we restored if you remember um, mm -hmm. um, when the budget was finalized and so um, we were actually able to sign a three-year contract, which I think does two things. One, it allows us to pay a cheaper cost, to be Correct. frank, over time. But two, if you remember the school committee meeting in June, uh, when we heard from our teaching staff, you know, there was, there were, you know, there was a need for additional PD to come with this and teacher support. And so uh, we wanted to send a signal to the teaching staff that this is something we are very invested in. It's something that isn't going to go anywhere. And it, we did take an opportunity to reset all the staff development uh, across the district um, for that. So I just wanted to highlight that and again and thank the committee for um, reinstating that. And to thank Dr. Falco, uh, Dr. Falco again um, for echoing the savings because if you look, it was over a $60,000 yeah. purchase and right now the, in to the total encumbrance is only $56,000 for the three-year purchase, which we're now going to then break out those costs. So it was pretty significant savings. Um, the transportation services, the, the number is also in red. I'm actually looking a little further into this. One of the contributing factors to this line is that there are salary encumbrances also in the 3300 line for bus monitors and for um, people for also for a bus driver that we employ so i need to check if you actually i doubt that many of you remember the september version of this document <coughs> i went back and i looked at the negative number in the september document and at that point, we were showing a negative balance of 21000 And between then and now, that's already come down 2000 So I need to look a little more closely at that. Um, we also have a large amount of money that will be coming in for reimbursements for transportation. So <coughs> it's not something concerning when you're looking at a $1.8 million <coughs> line item to see $10,000 here or there. Um, it's not dramatic. I'm not dismissing it, but it's not dramatic. Um, <laughs> if you look at the back of the sheet, the only other yeah. line that's still in the red. <laughs> the only. Speaking of dramatic. <laughs> this is a little more dramatic than that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, than transportation. So, however, uh, I would like to add that the we have started to get back um, information on our circuit breaker funding for the year. Which is looking, which is looking like it's slightly higher than we had originally anticipated. So between the IDEA, the 240 reimbursement money that comes in and the circuit breaker money, we're we're looking at trying to make sure that we're not we're not going too far under into out of district placements, which we know is a large expense for the district. 
Were there any specific questions on this? Sure. Do you know, um, or can you find out mm -hmm. what our our wheelchair bus is being used for? Just our if, if there's yeah. Mm -hmm. The original intention when that was purchased was to eliminate some from the comp the bus company. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I know we do use some not. transportation. We do mm -hmm. use some of our own transportation. Are we using it for specific wheelchair access, or is it still be, is it being used for the um, mm -hmm. the other program? So I yeah, I'll have to, I'll look into because that because I know I the answer. expense in our bus contract for the the handicap buses is, is significant. Pretty, it's, it is mm -hmm. I believe upwards of three hundred fifty dollars per day if I'm. Not okay. that. So I just want to make sure it's actually being used to relieve that, that expense. That cost. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I can definitely check into that and report back to the committee on it. Um, it had in the past years. I've not seen it this year, so I'm just my curiosity has sparked on who hmm. it's uh, oh, picking sense. up and dropping off. I've not. I've not. I know we, as you Take said, we employ the driver. It, so. We do yeah. have him. Yeah. But where is that van specifically being utilized? Mm -hmm. Just so you know, we can't report who. Oh, right. I just want to make sure it's, it's actually it transporting. Being it's being used. <laughs> a, 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 an actual I was aware. It, I was aware that we can't report him. Yeah. <laughs> used appropriately. <laughs> um, just, just on the use of the right correct vehicle <laughs> making sure that it's alleviating a excellent daily charge to our bus contract mm -hmm. are there any other questions on the cost center spend now can i may i just yeah. clarify this number in red the 339,857 is does that include a new out of district placement within that number Yes. Yeah, there's an increase in that. There's been okay. an increase. So yeah. that's something beyond our control. That's right. Just, again, because it's being sent out to the public, um, yes. I think yep. it's important and to And to clarify, that when we say an increase, an increase in the red number. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But, but uh, we actually were meeting, we had just met with, um, with Jill this week, and we were looking at how to balance. How to balance special ed. The, yes. Yep, I apologize. Um, okay. Thank you. I just, I, like I said, I just wanted to, I, I knew that, but yeah. um, I wanted to clarify it for people who see that very large number in red. And those costs are certainly under review. And again, those transportation costs are, are numbers that we get direct reimbursements for from the 240 and the circuit sure. breaker. So. Thank you. And so just quickly before Mr. Aaronworth looks at the next sheet, so when we, when we talk about um, the large cost drivers in our budget, we have the cost centers themselves, which was the second sheet that, you know, the sheet we just looked at, and we have our salary uh, spend down, we have our salary line. So those two documents um, really do outline um, the expenses in terms of where the money is going out to. And Mr. Aaronworth's gonna talk about where the money coming in. The third, the, the third sheet that I'll be providing uh, regularly at this point, and I'm, we're still tweaking which accounts will show up on this because um, some of them that don't have have not had any activity in them just yet haven't shown up on this revenue ex revenue page, but we've been working to make sure that we've put in a budget for all of the anticipated re revenues. And then some of the other revenues, like you can see, um, if you look partway down, there's the program revenue athletics. There's, uh, there's the user fee for athletics and for um, music user fees. And I know those were questions that had come up um, in some of our discussions to say, okay, I know there's two other documents that I probably won't get to th go too thoroughly into, but they really summarize the specifics, the details of both the athletics program spending and the music program spending. And I isolated what we've referred to in the past as the offsets. Mm -hmm. And those offsets are funds that are coming in through the user fee accounts. 
and I, the, a big purpose of this revenue sheet is to show that those, exp that those monies are actually being generated and are coming in to be applied to the offsets that we have in the budget. Um, one of the places you can look, and I actually just, I wasn't gonna print an updated document, but I looked at this today. Um, my bookkeeper has been out for about a little over a week. She um, had a loss in her family. Mm -hmm. But the athletics user fee while right now it shows a balance on this page of 3000 something dollars at this point given that we're a quarter of the way through the year we actually just updated some of the accounting in there and it's so it's a, over $14,000 that it has brought in and so that's a good example of those are funds that are used to offset some of the expenses um, there's nothing right now uh, that's of any major alarm on the revenue sheet. Everything seems to be coming in as it should be. We do have to we do have to put a number of things into this because, as I said, our the books are a little bit behind. We have to, we have to update some of the transactions that have taken place in the last week or so. We did just this past week get all of our grants. What happens is the grant the grant drawdowns the initial drawdown is from the state and they just send you the money and we hadn't gotten any yet and we just received all of our first grant drawdowns so those numbers should be changing pretty dramatically do we know uh, um, where the money goes that is collected from receipts from say basketball games is that program revenue yep that's, that's the program, that's program that's, that's, that goes into the program revenue yeah. line and is the program revenue um, the pre-k is that tuition Yes, that is. Yep. And I can provide if there's any questions by all means through email, I can provide any clarifications on the specifics of which which funds go into which account. Do we know so the athletic receipts that program revenue does that go back into the program? Where it it, do we it does. Okay. It does. Cuz I know that there was a comment made that it was went to the school or it no. I was not clear as to where that money went. Yeah. Well, do you mean, can I just ask a clarifying question? Yeah. So do you mean if um, we collect, you know, um, admission um, dollars yeah, yeah. At, at like the basketball game? Sure. Does that $5 go back to basketball? Or back into athletics? It goes into the athletic fund. Okay. It doesn't okay. go to boosters. So the, it okay. goes to the, the school's revenue yeah, the from athletic, the, it from goes the to the athletic fund program mm -hmm. program revenue Thank you. and and if you actually if you wanted to venture to the next couple of documents <laughs> if there are no specific questions mm -hmm. i know that there were um, questions about looking at the specific details involved in the music program and in the athletics program the first page can i just said one thing i'm sorry i'm mr to interrupt yeah, no. i just one of the one of the numbers on this sheet that i think the revenue sheet that's super important for us to just okay. keep in mind no that's okay uh if if you look at the budget line all the way at the end of the first column you see the twenty three million seven hundred seventy six thousand nine hundred ten dollars so this number as mr aaronworth mentioned will increase once we populate uh, and update all the other lines in here and that is such an important number for really for the public to see because i think you know i think the community gets the sense that there's that 22.6 million dollars that it costs to run the district it costs far more than that to run the district mm -hmm. and so i think this number once fully populated is a really important one to make sure that the public understands that it also takes all of the grant resources, the circuit breaker money, the Absolutely. reimbursements, the serv you know, the student fees for athletics, for, for music, et cetera, um, the title funds to really run the district where it is right now, which is above and beyond the 22.6 million. I can say when I left my office this afternoon, I was still populating some of those numbers and the sheet was at about 24.2 mm -hmm. million. And that's that's with the budgeted numbers none of the um, none of the program revenues have been budgeted into these yet um, because the athletics director is the music director that don't have a firm grasp of exactly what would have been brought in so we never include that number as a specific budgeted number it's a big operation it's a big 
Thank you. Yeah. So if you look at that first page, which is a, it, the, the one pager, which is the music program, I think that's a lot easier to see um, in, in its entirety. This is the detailed description of everything that was budgeted for this fiscal year for the music program. Line by line, the accounts are on the left side that you can see which account everything is coded to. Um, if you flip the page over, what I've done is I've shown what in the blue line what it is that has actually been budgeted to be expended. So it says 129284 That's the anticipated expenses that we're going to be seeing in the music program. If you look right below that, those are offsets that were automatically plugged into the actual budget. So when you look at the, when you look at the cost center number for music, you're not seeing $129,000. You're seeing, um, you're seeing, do, 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 I believe 95, it's 95. Yep. Thank you for catching. You're welcome. I probably could have read the other number on this sheet, but <laughs> the, you're seeing the 95,000 number. Um, some of that is from offsets that are going to come from the user fees, and I've identified the specific amounts of the user fees that are going to be used for those offsets and what those offsets are going to be applied toward. So you can see that some of the transportation, there's a $13,000 offset from user fees. Some of the actual salaries for the, for the directors of, of different musical ensembles, that's coming out from user fees, 6000 And then some of the music, the contracts for the, for the performances or for the sheet music is coming out for $7,000. Um, so if I subtract that out, the actual budgeted amount as listed here is 103000 And then initially people will jump and say, wait a second, for I sure. thought it's $95,000. <laughs> that yellow block that I highlighted mm -hmm. are the expenses that, uh, that Todd put into his actual music budget, but they're accounted for instructional supplies. So those are, that's a part of the music budget that's really for the classes, for music class. So that's those are getting line. a different yes. line. It's, it's, yeah. They're accounted in the instructional supplies line. So that'll close that gap. Yep. Gotcha. So I provided these just to show a, a much clearer view of where the expenses were coming and where the money was coming from to cover those expenses. And one of the things, if I may, Ms. Aaronworth, I think that is also really great to be able to do is, is we can look at the actual budget breakdown, we can look at the cost center sheet, and then we can crosswalk that with the revenues in any given area to really make sure that we have that triangle of alignment that we need um, when we're really looking at each and every expenditure and each and every line. Not to say that we always need to do that, but I just think it's important to make sure that we have the availability to do that every month when we meet as a to review these uh, documents. My hope would be is I'll be trying to look ahead at all of those, and if there are any indicators that you should be aware of, Dr. Tefalco and I will certainly make people aware of them. Um, I'm not going to walk line by line through the athletics, <laughs> um, but you can see, I know there were some questions about how much we actually had budgeted for athletics. If you look at the very last page, um, it's, it's clear that while we listed the budget at $180,000 and people said, how could we possibly be running our athletics program on $180,000? That's accurate. Um, there's about $73,000 in offsets for the athletics program. And I will say that uh, Jill and I have met and gone over the anticipated revenue the from the athletic director. Uh, yeah. I just second yeah. Jill. That's right. I want to make sure you're thinking. <laughs> That's these right. I just keep. <laughs> I keep saying Jill. My apologies. Just so everybody at home knows who you're talking about. Jill, the athletic director. <laughs> We've met and gone over the expected revenues from these user, fee, user fees 
and they're coming very close to the budgeted amounts. There are there we haven't had an extensive amount of time to sit down together, given that she's been out. Been out, um, but that's next on on our list. What's the notation that you have like after each sport where it says girls JV vet basketball nine times sixty two times two? Those are actually those are actually Jill's oh, okay. notations, okay. but I can I can tell you that's um, for the they have to they have to cover the officials mm -hmm. and it's for the amount of time the amount of officials and the amount of games that they have for each. Okay. Um, I think I have that right. The first page is the buses. The first page is the buses, which shows the yep, the cost per per trip, yeah. and then how many trips they're going to be making. I can get some better clarification for that. So based on that explanation, yeah, is it true that the athletic budget is actually one hundred and eighty thousand dollars? plus any user fees? That's a good assumption. I can't say that it's the total of the user fees. The $180,000 is what's been budgeted to come out of the town's portion of the school, of the school budget. Or the general revenue. The general, or, yep, from the general revenue. The actual budget is $253,047.94. Which is what we've been trying to say since I've sat in this seat. That it's it. There's no end. Right. But we we set a budget number that means nothing if increased user fees come in. They just get a bigger budget, and that's the same for music or athletics. Correct. They're both. Are they both treated the same? They have a set line item plus user fees, no matter what they are. I can't speak to how they have been treated. I can say that Dr. DeFalco and I are focusing on transparency with regards to the numbers. So when we look at these budgets and we're looking to see, okay, what programs are being funded, I will try my very best to show you every source of funding that's going into them. And then the decisions that we make as a, as a well, that you make as a school committee and that trickles down through the district, those will be incorporating all of the different sources of, of funding. So, but but as you have worked with the program managers yes. who have the responsibility for these budgets, mm -hmm. this is this is what they have budgeted for this academic year. That so, if accurate. user fees come in at fifty thousand dollars above that they don't have another fifty thousand dollars to just do willy-nilly this is their budget for this year and to that end right yes, yes. And to that end to the I apologize opposite. if I misunderstood that now, question the, there's an anticipation of athletic user fees at seventy three thousand right. dollars if uh, you know if this falls sh short I think Bethany we were kind of discussing right. this if this falls short of this they gotta cut something. we gotta cut something yeah but when do we make that decision well, we need to spring. We, is it going to spring? Well, I know. So spring sports. So there needs the to be. I'll explain. So let, yeah. So no, that's a good question. Let me explain. And so there needs to be a forecasting of revenue and through user fees. Right. And so there needs to be some historical data, some longitudinal data that says we usually have in winter sports these. I'll make up a number. Five sports with these 10 kids, 11 kids, 15 kids, et cetera, et cetera. We can build this out because right now, as Mr. Aaronworth mentioned just with the fall um, uh, fall sport user fees uh, in particular we're at 14,000 and so when we were doing some kind of faster math it was looking like maybe 15,000 a season so we weren't far from that mark you know you're looking at 45,000 total mm -hmm. and so now we're you know now you're 45,000 compared to 73, 73. we're short yeah. mm -hmm. and so th there is no and I want to really kind of underscore this there's no burden for the additional, you know, in this particular case, you, you know, whatever it is, $30,000 to be picked up by the district. From what I understand, that actually we were supposed to go in the other direction. If we remember when we were having this discussion in August or July, I don't recall which meeting, um, there was a number set at 120. 
and I had showed the number of 180 and thought the user fees were that 60,000. Correct. Right. Little did we know now that we're, you know, we've, we've really drilled into these numbers line by line. I mean, we ordered one needle. I can tell you, the one needle for a soccer ball, like mm -hmm. to pump up the soccer ball. I mean, that's how, like, in the weeds we are <laughs> in this budget. Like, you know, we, like, now we know that there was a forecasting of $73,000 in user fees. You know, and right now, it doesn't look like we're going to hit that, but we don't know yet. We've got to forecast each season to see. Oh. And, make, and to your point, though, that also incorporates, I believe, the gate fees. So I, right. but I don't see that as a user offset down here. I don't know that it's, I don't know that yes. it's listed specifically as a user. That, again, these, the, what you're seeing are notations that when would have just plugged into the budget sense program. Mm -hmm. So I can't, I can't say if her intention was just user fee offsets or if the Revenue. thought was gate slash right. user fee and she was just referencing just it as so a Just so you know, the offset. only gates we charge for is varsity football and varsity mm. basketball. I believe it doesn't break 5,000 for both together. So okay. I, if I'm, I, I'm, I'm going off of a number from <clears throat> memory from last yeah. year, it's not thousands of I, dollars. I did, I, did have, I did have that conversation w with Jill, the athletics director. We did go through a preliminary process of outlining what the anticipated user mm -hmm. fees were going to be coming in at. That's and they cool. were, I think the gate fees were closer to 10,000. Um, but they're also, I could be mistaken as well, um, but their number was, it was pretty close. I think her budget to what the total numbers were at, at the time we calculated them, were about $7,000 short. Um, and actually, in my preliminary conversations with her, she said, does that mean we have to cut everything yeah. in athletics? I said, no, but an excellent exercise would be for you to go back and just start going through things and seeing where we can have the conversations. I, yeah, I mean, the first thing I look at is this first page of all these trips times the expense of, of travel. We do have two vans at our disposal. So mm -hmm. just, you know. Yeah. Especially the cross country, the teams are yeah, so tiny. They're just so small, and mm -hmm. I know that they it needs to start now and not with just Douglas to split the transportation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that valid point. We yeah, yeah. excellent point. I understand that. Yeah. Are there any other questions regarding the specifics of? And if if you look at these in further detail and you have any questions, by all means, I, I can answer them at a at another time or direct you to Jill, the athletic director, <laughs> with regards to the little formulas on the transportation. Uh, and I can only speak for myself, but I appreciate the work that was put into this mm -hmm. because we have felt like we've been flying in the dark um, and getting different numbers every time a different person asked a question a different way. Um, and now it feels like this is what's in front of us. And yes, we still have work to, to figure out what the X's and O's you know, really mean or where they really come from. But it's, you know, it's very clear. We have $180,000 in general revenue fees and $73 in, in user fee offsets, and that's their budget. And if they can't meet the user fee offsets, then there's cuts to the budget. And if they exceed the user fee offsets, then they have, I don't know, reserve they can use in future years. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Facil it's still you. Facility, Facility report. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll try to be quick. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of, I guess we should probably start with the Millville Elementary MSBA project. Um, as of right now, we have completed all of the documents that we were supposed to for the initial submission. Uh, where we stand is that we need to take a vote on language that would be appropriating $50,000 for the feasibility study of putting in the boiler uh, and the work that goes into designing, designing the boiler and the heating system. Um, after the school, just for as an overview, after the school committee votes, then we document our vote. 
that information gets shared with both towns, Blackstone and Millville, just for point of reference. They, we have to document that we've shared, that we voted this, and then the information gets shared with Millville specifically for them to determine how they may or may not want to act upon the decision of the district to move forward with this process. So before we move into this vote, can you define that a little bit better for us? So this says that we would appropriate $50,000 for paying the cost of the feasibility study. Correct. That's $50,000 that comes out of our so funds or, or, or is reimbursed eventually by MSBA or paid for yeah. by the town and then reimbursed? Yeah. Portion so my under the, my understanding of the process mm -hmm. is that by going through MSBA we receive a set amount of a reimbursement right. through them right. on any project that we embark on mm -hmm. either by ourselves or with with the town um, they don't have a set reimbursement until after they evaluate the the, the project the initial steps what happens is we procure funding we appropriate funding as a district then we would get funding through the bank through the form of some debts that we take out a bond or however what type of loan we would get from the bank and then the money is charged back to the towns in their assessment so the money goes the, their portion of what they need to pay is is charged back to the towns through their assessment and then msba reimburses the school percentage the school is whatever percent they've decided on but but because this is the millville elementary school project the only town assessed is millville correct the only assessment would be to millville similar to the JFK, JFK project where the Blackstone. assessment is to Blackstone and so we, yep. so Millville in its special town meeting in November has to have a item on the warrant to approve this as well or no they may choose to do so so the three options are they can they have a few options they can put it on the warrant just as a yes or a no they can put it on the warrant under the condition of a two and a half override they can ignore what it is that we've sent to them in which case then the district has the authority to move forward if we don't receive any kind of response which certainly we're not hoping is the case and then I believe they have the authority to, to say that they are not going to be paying for it Sorry. <laughs> I need for that sound to come out. Um, have has anyone had conversations with? I'm not even sure who the leader of Millville is at this point. Um, town administrator or um, selectman, board of selectmen, about this to to see where they're at. I mean, if we expend the fifty thousand dollars, <coughs> is there any harm for us in the long run, or does Millville just have to figure out a way to? make it work I don't know if that's the right way to ask that question but is or, there or any, let is me there ask any danger way. of us losing if, our fifty thousand dollars well if Millville votes no there's no reimbursement because it doesn't go to MSBA correct well but it doesn't so but this goes to MSBA this right here doesn't it yes mm -hmm. I don't believe I can conf I can reconfirm but I don't believe that until the process of identifying the funding is finished that there's a commitment to okay. the actual expenditure so if we were to vote and say we agree that we want to move forward with this project Millville has 60 days from the night of this vote to determine and and respond with whether or not they're going to be on board with it if they were to choose that that's not going to happen then it doesn't mean that we still have to pay someone to do a feasibility study um, I, I, we wouldn't engage anyone to yeah. do that feasibility study until we knew that the process was wholly moving forward 
So has there been conversations with anybody in leadership position in Millville with respect to this? So there was, issue. I know, there was leading up to this. And okay. so, um, uh, and since um, we had a, uh, I would say a more informal conversation at the joint meeting uh, about the need for this mm -hmm. uh, to get on to, um, for us to get in front of the board, to be frank, to have this conversation and vote. So I know there has been, there was some initial dialogue with uh, prior administration um, and there has been uh, some more informal conversations with them at the joint meeting. So you're trying, are you tr currently trying. trying to yes. get on their agenda? I, I, I happened to watch the 39 minute meeting this morning from um, October 1st. They spoke of it. Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen did. And I believe their concern was coming up with this money, which looks like we're doing, and then waiting for the reimbursement. Um, it was mentioned that previously that is how it was done, where we, um, so the, the discussion didn't go beyond this amount of money. Um, but I think they're looking for the project was the um, impression that I got. What do you mean they're by looking for the project? Well, they're, they know what needs to be done. Oh, they're looking yeah. for the MSPA so, reimbursement. So, right. Right. But, but they, in fact, would be, they don't have to outlay the money today. Correct. But they would ultimately be responsible. It would be for rolled the money. into the total project price. They, um, I don't want to quote it, but quote what they spoke of. But they, I believe they were referencing um, a roof project, mm -hmm. and we paid for the feasibility, and then it went through reimbursement. Right. Um, and they were simply speaking of if it can be done that way again, because they definitely don't have the, and it looks like we already laid it out. To do it manner. that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Thank to, you. to continue, we are reaching out to try to yeah. make sure we all understand the same. Thanks. My question tonight is, can we do this without Tara here? Uh, we can do it without Tara, but then Tara still has seven days to get it to the two towns. Is she in town? She's not today. I don't know when she returns. Okay. <laughs> so this isn't saying that she she's saying that it happened at a meeting. Correct. Are we under a timeline to, to do this vote? We are. Yes, yes. I thought so. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I will entertain a motion that the Blackstone Millville Regional School District appropriate the amount of $50,000 for paying cost of project funding feasibility study portion for the Millville Elementary School 122 Berthelet Way, Millville, Mass., 1529 including all costs incidental and related thereto the project said amount to be expended under the direction of the school committee to meet this appropriation the district is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to mass general law chapter 71 section 16 d and the district agreement as amended or pursuant to any other enabling authority the district acknowledges that the massachusetts school building authorities msba's grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need as determined by the MSBA shall be the sole responsibility of the district, provided further that the amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this vote shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the project funding agreement that may be executed between the district and the MSBA. Any premium received by the district upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote less any such premium applied to the payment of the cost of insurance uh, issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of cost approved by this vote in accordance with chapter 44 section 20 of the general laws thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount i will entertain that motion if somebody so would moved. like to make it without Second. having to read it again <laughs> moved by aaron seconded by bethany is there any discussion Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions. Okay. So uh, next step is that um, Tara will need to go into the office to sign it. Um, so somebody will contact yes. her. Yep. And then uh, needs to be distributed to both.
towns and we will look to um, get to a, a Millville Board of Selectmen meeting and get on their agenda to um, discuss the steps of the process. Okay. Okay. Still you, Matt. Excellent. Jane, um, do we have the on the bottom vote? Quick, I, no. Oh. That's just the process. Okay. Quick, quick update on some of the other ongoings with respect to our facilities and our lovely buildings. Um, right now, the at the complex, the um, MSBA, the ME, the MSBA process is entering the sixty percent completion phase for the for the um, schematic design. So they're going to be submitting the paperwork to to have that completed for JFK so that we can hopefully move forward and get things in place to have the work done over this coming this coming summer. Um, at MES, the fire panel was put in this past Friday, as well as the pipe was dug up and, and cleaned so that we will hopefully not experience any further water leakage at MES. Mm -hmm. And at the middle school, we referenced that there was the finding of some <coughs> some mold in the in one of the office areas that has been taken care of. Um, I did check into the possibility of whether or not there was a warranty on the roof. I was informed. I was informed that. Um, given some unfortunate circumstances of a large snow removal process that happened some years ago, that warranty was voided. <laughs> um, so we, we bore the cost of making those remediation steps. Um, the, at the high school, the RFP went out for the f new fire panel, and we have received, at, to date, one proposal. Um, there are a few vendors that came and visited and um, also had some communications with the chief of and we have one proposal that currently came in and that's where things stand right now thank you thank you did the Millville fire panel get installed over the long weekend yeah that was installed on Friday that's Friday complete. on Friday yeah. complete okay. Does anyone have any school committee forum issues that they would like to bring up? Okay. Um, our next workshop meeting is October 24th. And our next regularly scheduled meeting is Wednesday, November 14th. Um, both of those meetings will be here. Uh, at this time, I will entertain a motion to move to executive session um, for the purpose of discussing a complaint of an employee and the purpose of conducting collective bargaining strategy session with the Blackstone Millville Teachers Association and to adjourn after executive session not to return to general meeting. Move by, moved by Aaron, seconded by Tam, oh, Bethany. Um, we need a roll call for that. Bethany. Bethany. Bunton. Just yes. say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. Um, but we'll actually take a.